Good to go. Good morning, church family. I always hate being the bad guy and disrupting great fellowship and uh, conversations, but good morning. Uh, we're excited you're here this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're especially grateful uh, that you're here with us this morning. In the back of the pews, you'll notice some uh, Let's Connect cards. And so for members and for guests, if you would want to fill those out, you can drop those in the uh, boxes around the auditorium as you leave uh, that we use for collection and those kind of things. But if you have prayer requests, if you have needs, or just want to connect with this family and with this body, uh, if you would, you can fill those out and, and leave those for us. Uh, in some family news this morning, uh, we rejoice with the Matthews family. Uh, with Darren and Kim Matthews, would like to announce the arrival of a new grandson, David Miller Matthews. Uh, he was born April 7th to Hayden and Peniel Matthews. Proud great-grandparents are Kay Matthews and Gary and Ruth Ann Barnes. So we rejoice with the Matthews family and with Hayden and uh, Peniel. Some that we want to make sure we continue to lift up in prayer and their, their families. Uh, Sympathy to Barry and Melinda Gibson's daughter, Amber Gibson, passed away Monday, April 10th. Services were yesterday. Uh, Barry and Melinda are in Jim Gurchick's shepherding group. So if we continue to remember the Gibson family. Also, we have an update on Brother Howard Norton. Uh, Brother Norton is still in cardiovascular ICU at St. Vincent. Uh, he is stable, uh, but they are requesting no visitors at this time. And then also Kay Matthews is at home recovering from hip replacement surgery and doing well. And then a few others that we need to continue to, to lift up, them and their families, uh, Brian Harrington, Charlie Carroll, John Hacker, and Rick Watson. Let's continue to remember those families uh, in our prayers and, and uh, surround them with love and, uh, that we can. So good morning again, and let's, uh, I think Noel has a special uh, announcement for us this morning. I'm going to invite the uh, Daigle family to come on up. Robin, just bring your family right on up. I gave Robin strict orders not to steal the show from me this morning. <laughs> come right on up here. This is the Daigle family, and I'd like to introduce you to the, the youngest, newest uh, member of our family. Of course, this is Josh and Savannah Daigle. They have a daughter, uh, Robin, who I think she told me she was 12 years old. So... <laughs> How old are you, Robin? Four. She is four years old, and she's adorable. And then I'd like to introduce you to Wren Olivia, who was born on March 16th of this year. And so this is her debut here in the auditorium at College Church. And you, it's kind of hard to tell with that big, beautiful bow on, but she is already needing a haircut. And so Mr. Noel and many of us in the audience, we have follicle envy when, it, when we look at that head of hair. But we have asked this morning if Chris City would come and we're going to have a prayer blessing uh, for the Daigle family. The Daigles are a special part of my family and um, that's why I had to write out a prayer this morning because I may not be able to, to do it if I don't read it. So. I, I hate to say, but I'm old enough to be Robin and Wren's grandpa, and so I can't, I, that's kind of how I, I think that's my, I think that's my role, so, and I'm, I'm proud, proud of it. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this, this family. We're so thankful that they're a part of my family. Lord, we're thankful that they're a part of this church family. Father, you've given us uh, so many good opportunities in our lives, and we're so thankful for the doors that you open and that you allow us to walk through. Father, you've given us so many, so many good gifts, and there are no greater gifts in this, on this earth than our families, and especially our children. Father, you've blessed Josh and Savannah with two beautiful little girls. For Robin, who entered their lives in such an amazing way that, that only you could provide that. And for Wren now, for little Wren, who we are so thankful, who has arrived safely and healthy to their family. 
Father, we ask that you would now bless this family that you have created. Father, please bless Josh and Savannah as they raise their children in the way that you want them to. We pray that you would bless them with wisdom and give them the ability to guide their children. And Father, help Josh and Savannah to make great decisions. Father, when difficulties arise, as, as certainly as, as we as older parents know will, we pray that you'd bless them with a great sense of your presence and of your spirit. Father, please bless them with so many good times and joyful occasions and help them to make so many good memories. And Father, remind them to praise you for those good, for those good times. Bless these little girls with a heart to follow you, Lord, and give them a desire to serve in your kingdom. Give them the sense of security and the sense of peace as they grow and then throughout all their lives that only they, that it can only come from you. Father, we know that you love us and we know that you love this family and we know that, we know that you love these little girls. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. sing together. <laughs> Lord, speak to me that I may
Will you bow with me in prayer? Our holy and righteous Father, we are so grateful that we can come before you with our prayers, our prayers of, of thanksgiving for all the good that you've done for us and continue to do for us. To come to you on behalf of those who are in need of our prayers, we would ask your special care and concerns for uh, Charlie Carroll and for Brian Harrington and Howard Norton, especially for Howard Norton at this time as he's re recovering from his surgery. And uh, we pray that you will be with him and watch over him and give him special care. We pray also that you will be with Rick Watson. We come to you on behalf of our elders, that you will guide them as they lead us and give them the good insight and, and the will to do what is best for the congregation. And may we follow in such a way that will benefit the, your work here in this town. We're thankful for our graduating seniors. We pray that you will bless them as they launch out into this uh, world and to either further their education or whatever they choose to do, that you will be with them and bless them and guide them. And may they always look to you uh, for your guidance as well. We're thankful for the time we have here to worship this morning. We pray that you will be with us and that we may worship in a way acceptably to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. morning I'll be reading from Psalm 19 verses 7 through 11. Psalm 19 verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. In his presence there is I do an activity in my classes at the high school every year, uh, and I, I give one instruction. 
it's to listen. After that, I'll ask a series of questions where the answer is either yes or no. But the answer is not found in the question. The answer is found in listening uh, to something that's very specific, how I ask the question. It's not, you know, I could ask, is this a piece of paper? And the answer might be no. Well, it's, it's in, the answer is found in how I ask the question, not in the question itself. Uh, throughout this series of questions, my students usually become very frustrated, which is fun for me because they frustrate me. So. Um, <laughs> It's a little payback, but I enjoy it, uh, and maybe they'll learn to listen a little bit better. But as Christians, we also kind of do the same thing. We ask questions, and we don't listen for the answer. Or we're too busy creating an answer, and we don't hear it in ourselves. Uh, we don't wait for the Lord's answer. We, we want the answer now. Some of my students, even you know, if they struggle to get the answer, they'll Google it. Well, that's not on Google. Sometimes, as Christians, we may find ourselves looking in, in places that uh, are not the Bible or not prayer to find our answers. Uh, there is one question, though, that we, we know the answer to. Uh, and the question is, as sinners, where, what, do we, what can we do to earn our salvation? Can we earn our salvation? Uh, I want you to listen carefully to the words from Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God showed His love for us in that while we were still sinners, He died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, now, we, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That question has been answered. We don't have to, we don't have to look in other places. The answer is right here. Even though we're sinners, God died for us. The Lord's Supper that we're about to partake of is a remembrance of that death and an honoring of that death. Um, so let's, uh, let's pray for the, the bread. God, we are so thankful for the death that you gave on the cross. We're also thankful for the life that it brings to us. Even though the death was excruciating, we now have life through it. The, the sacrifice has been made. And Lord, we remember that right now as, as we partake of the bread that represents your flesh that was torn. Help us to remember it. And help us to also be living as if that sacrifice matters to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's now pray for the blood. God, we are so thankful for the death. As we now partake of the fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was lost on Calvary, we ask that you would help us to take it in a, in a way that's well-pleasing and that, uh, that honors you. Help our lives to also uh, honor you and help us to live through you. It's in Jesus' name, amen.
on the screen behind me, you'll see a lot of several different ways to give. There are more than just four ways to give. Uh, as I pray for the offering, I'm going to pray that we live our lives as a contribution to the Lord, as an offering to the Lord, not just uh, a Sunday morning thing we do, but as something that uh, is in us and is who we are. Let's pray. God, you have given us so much, and we are so thankful for the things you have given us. Lord, we know none of it is ours. It all belongs to you. Help us to live uh, with that mindset, with the mindset that Sunday mornings is not the only time that we give, that we give throughout the week, and we uh, continue to give throughout the rest of our lives. Uh, help us to live through through Jesus this week, and help us to uh, be a gift to other people as you were a gift to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll be dismissing our children during the singing of this next song. Let's stand while they are dismissed. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. a little equipment repair this morning. <laughs> Is that on? Okay. Good morning. Keep your Bibles open to the scripture reading just a moment ago in Psalms 19. While I say that we're glad that you're here and we welcome our guests with us. Thank you for being a part of us. We've got a good crowd this morning. Jane, it's wonderful to see you and our prayers with you and with Howard. We're grateful that the surgery went well, but I know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, who are praying for Howard and you this morning. But it's wonderful to see, uh, see you this morning. I appreciate what Enoch had to say around our table about listening because I'm a preacher. I like to talk. It's kind of part of being a preacher. And while I'm up here talking and talking and talking, <laughs> you're out there listening. I love preaching because while I'm talking and talking, the, the cool thing about preaching as opposed to teaching, you don't ever interrupt me. I just get to talk and talk and talk, and you're just at my mercy. And so I love preaching for that reason. Um, and it's just kind of who we are, but we all know that there's, there's some times when, while I'm talking, you're probably out there, and this is also, this is probably more true of preachers who are out there, while I'm talking, I have something I'd like to say. Boy, I, on this subject, there's something that I think I could share. If you would just be quiet enough, long enough, to let us talk. You ever been in one of those kind of communication things where someone's talking and talking but not listening and not sharing there's something to be said about listening and hearing because all of us want to be heard we want people to know what we think what we say what we what we've done what we plan to do and if we don't have someone this is probably more true in our culture than it has ever been before if we do not have someone personally to talk to at that moment, then we turn to social media. Then we think everybody's listening to us, and we blog, and we 
share videos and we post things on our wall. We have Snapchat and we have um, uh, TikTok and all of these things because we believe that we have something that everybody else needs to know what we're thinking, what we're doing, what our kids are doing. And many times, even Christians, their walls are full on Facebook. Sometimes it's maybe good quotes, spiritual quotes. Sometimes it's full of rants and whining and complaining. But the point is, even when we don't have someone to talk to, we're still talking and we're still sharing and we're still communicating even if there's no one listening, really. My grandmother had a sign in her house that hung there for years, and it was that old Mark Twain quote that said, it's better to keep your mouth closed and, and other people think you're a fool than to open up your mouth and, remove all, uh, mouth and remove all doubt. And I think she had that in there just so I would see it every time I came into her house. Remember the old country song? I think um, Keith Whitley made it famous, and then Alison Krauss made it more famous. You say it best when you say nothing at all. There's a time to, to talk, but there's a time to be quiet and to listen. Back in 2011, 2012, there was an Eddie Murphy movie called A Thousand Words. And Eddie Murphy played Jack McCall, and he was a fast-thinking, quick-talking uh, agent and he would use his words, almost predominantly all of his words were used to manipulate people, to take advantage of people, and he just yak, 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 yak. And he's a fast talker. Eddie Murphy played this character to the T. But through a course of events, he became connected to a tree that had a thousand leaves on it, and each leaf was attached to a word that he would say. And he had 1,000 words left that he could speak. After that thousandth word was over, he would die. And he believed that he would die. And it was kind of a good message to the movie, but the message was not really, if you only had a thousand words, what words would you choose to speak? That really wasn't the message of the movie. As much as, what can you learn if you'll be quiet enough to listen. James tells us that we need to be very slow to speak, very quick to listen, because God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you hearing? Effective communication is the lifeblood to every relationship. I don't care what it is, whether it's a relationship between a boss and a, an employee, husband and wife, parents and children, neighbors. Good communication is the lifeblood to every relationship. And when there's good two-way communication, where you're, you are sharing and talking and communicating, the relationships and the friendships and the, and the companionship grows. But we know especially in the area of a marriage, where there's no good communication, that marriage becomes unsatisfying. Couples begin to drift and grow apart and they become distant. That is especially true in your spiritual walk with God. Without talking to God with prayer, listening to God as you open up His Word, as you worship Him, and you listen to His Word being read as it did uh, was just a moment ago, with, without good communication where you are speaking to God, sharing with God, and, and telling God the praise that you want to give Him and the things that you know that you need from Him. But also without that two-way communication of listening to God, it may be that your relationship, you don't feel as close to God as you really want to feel. Your worship to God is not as meaningful to you as it once was meaningful. Because the relationship is absolutely founded on the communication that you have. What happens? What happens when we stop long enough to listen to the voice of God, to the Word of God, to know the will of God? What happens when we allow those things? Well, the relationship will automatically grow stronger. Now, that takes intentionality. 
I'm not just saying it automatically that if you just start reading your Bible more, the, the relationship is just going to grow and grow and grow. There's intentionality that needs to take place there. Going back to Psalms 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving, bringing to life again the soul. The more that we get into the Word, intentionally getting into the Word, not to just check it off today, okay, I've read my three chapters, getting into the Word to listen to hear the voice of God speaking directly to you. When that kind of communication is happening, your, your relationship with God will deepen. It, it will become revived and in life uh, will, will be restored. It will grow stronger. But then our sense of spiritual and moral direction, that also grows stronger and wiser. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. Now, I think the word simple there, it, it really is referring to those people who simply have not closed their mind or their hearts to the Word of God. You know, that's really true of our culture. Our culture is not so simple. Oh, are we smart. Oh, are we enlightened. Boy, do we know our stuff. And there's a lot of pride and arrogance in our culture today that says we don't want to open our hearts up to the Word of God. We don't want to know the Word of God. We don't want the Word of God speaking to us or telling us what to do or how to live. And they're not very wise. Our country has lost its moral direction. It calls what is good evil and what is evil good. And if our world wants to know what truth is, if they want the answer if they want to know exactly what they should do or think or feel or vote or however, they Google it. That's where they get their truth. I will Google it and I'll keep Googling until I find the answer I want. The Word of God enlightens those who are simple enough to say, God is on His throne. He is the Creator. I trust Him. I'm going to listen to Him. When I was a young man, I was tempted by something. I was tempted by a lot of things, but especially by beer. My dad drank a lot, a lot of beer. He worked in the oil patch. And I would sneak a lot of my dad. He had so much, he didn't know when, when uh, some were gone. And I learned as a young man very quickly, I love beer. I, could dr I, I didn't have to get used to the taste. I didn't have to acquire it. I liked beer. But I also saw the dark side of beer and alcohol. I saw what it did to my parents' relationship and their marriage. I saw what it did to his health. And so I saw, I saw the other side that the beer commercials never show you. And, and I saw the side that, you know, I, I don't ever have someone that comes into my office and, and tells me how much better their marriage is because they drink. Now, I hear all the other stories. Well, I learned quickly that that's probably something I needed to stay away from. Now, I was deeply tempted, but you know, as I've listened more and more to the voice of God, wanting to know the will of God, now, I understand. I understand that the Bible never says directly that you need to abstain 100% from alcohol. But I also know that the Scripture never put alcohol in a good light. And so if you listen to the voice of God, and if you really listen to what he's saying to you, I, I, when I listened, it told me that that's probably something I needed to stay away from. And I've never regretted because I think God helped to enlighten my eyes. Here's another thing when we stop to listen to God. Our hearts grow more humble. Again, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And I suppose that means that you become more humble in, in the way you think about things. The more you realize that God really is who He is, that He's on His throne, that He is the Creator, and you'll trust Him more than you'll trust in your own wisdom. When you listen to the wisdom of the world, the world says, Ah, uh, who are you to tell me what's right or wrong? I don't need that Bible. I don't need all those rules and commands. I know what's best for me. You're listening to the pride and their arrogance talk. But you and I are different. We believe that God is the one who sits on the throne, should sit on the throne of our heart. We believe that God is our creator, that we didn't just happen in this world. 
that God created us, and He built in us the desire to worship Him. And so we now humble ourselves and our thinking and what we think uh, would be the best way to guide our lives, and we listen to our Creator who's enlightened our eyes, who's made us to see things, to know that God's way really is the best way. But then here's something else that happens when we listen. Our desire to keep on listening to God grows more and more. I love the song that's based on verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. It's the Word of God. It's sweeter than honey that drips from the honeycomb. We desire a vibrant relationship with God and... And I hope you desire that your children and your grandchildren will have a vibrant, deep, wonderful relationship with God. That means we all need to be listening. One generation cannot stop listening to God and just think that it's a natural that the next generation will. If you want your children and grandchildren to have the kind of relationship with God that you really want them to have, then you need to be listening to Him. And you need to be walking with Him, following His way and His will. His, uh, will. And, and someone may stop listening to God because, let's be honest, it's not always easy. Someone will say, well, I tried to read the, the Bible, and I was reading through, and, and, and I, uh, Genesis is kind of interesting, and, and Exodus, that, that had a lot of great stories. But then I hit a wall at Leviticus. Leviticus just threw me for a loop. That's, that's tough. That's hard. And I said, well, you haven't even got to numbers yet. I understand it's not easy. <laughs> and it's not just Leviticus. There's a lot of passages. There's a lot of texts in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Testament, it's complicated at times. It's difficult to understand at times, especially if you really don't know the Word of God and you weren't raised in a home that taught you the Word and sent you to Bible class and you had the flannel gla- graphs and, and, and you sang the songs and you kind of grew up learning more and more and more. If someone just starts almost at scratch to just read the Word of God, it's difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. Even if you don't understand everything you're reading in the Bible, the things that we don't understand are not really what trips us up, though, let's be honest. Usually it's the things that we do understand that give us the most difficulties. Things like, Praying for those who are called your enemies. Loving those who persecute you. Giving back to God the way you have been prospered. Sharing the gospel with the people that are your neighbors and acquaintances. See, every one of us knows that we need to be doing those things. And especially when it comes to, be, to uh, making disciples. We all know that we need to be doing that. That's not the problem. We, it's not what we know that trips us up, uh, that, that is from it. It's doing what we know. That's, that becomes the, the difficult thing. It's not an easy thing to do. And so I still maintain that there's portions of the Bible that may be difficult, but the more consistently we listen to the Word of God, the more we understand what His will for our lives is, the greater our desire becomes. Have you ever listened to someone who's given you really, really good advice? Maybe a stock tip. Maybe some advice on how to handle the difficult situation. And they gave you really wonderful advice. Makes you want to listen to them more, doesn't it? That's the way it should be with God. When it comes to your marriage and your relationship and your children and your neighbors. When it comes to how you just live your life day by day. God through his word has given us really good advice he has given us divine wisdom and if you understand that you'll want to listen to him more look at verse 11 in psalm 19 moreover by them what's the them the the law of god the precepts of god 
the commandments of God, your servant is warned in keeping them, keeping that law, keeping those commands, by following them, he says there's, there's great reward. There's hidden treasure. There's real blessing by keeping the Word of God real in your life. So what are some of the benefits? What is the reward that we might receive by, by listening to the voice of God? We see more and more how amazing His love is for us. So many people think you just... If you want to know how much God loves you, just go to the New Testament. Just read the Gospels. Well, that's, that's, that's true, but that's not altogether true. I can see the love of God on every page of the Old Testament. As God chose His people, and even at times when His people were unfaithful to Him and turned to other gods, God never stopped loving them. Sometimes He disciplined His people. Sometimes He sent other armies in to discipline His people. But God never stopped loving his people. He would always have a remnant that would be ready to receive once again the blessings of God and the rewards of God when they turn to God. But I can see it in the Old Testament. I can see the love of God in the book of Psalms and through the prophets. But I certainly see it when I come to the New Testament and I read the words of Christ that are in red. And the love of God just drips off the pages as I listen to Jesus explain to us his Father in heaven, and the kingdom of God. And then I get into the epistles, and I learn that God loves us so much that He saved us by, not because of how good we are or, or the works that we've done, He saved us by, our, by His grace through our faith. And then you read all the way through the New Testament, learning more and more about the manifold aspects of God's love, and you come to the book of Revelation. Talk about a complicated and difficult book to read. But I tell you, if you ever really get into Revelation and, and learn its meaning, what, what it says is God loves you. He's going to walk with you even through the most difficult times of life. And guess what? You will have victory in Jesus Christ. I, I learn about how amazing God's love the more I get into His Word. But I also hear and see that God gives good things and blessings to His people. As I read through the Bible, I read about a God that is not trying to control every aspect of our life as much as He's trying to bring joy to our life, to allow us to live the abundant life that we can have through Jesus Christ. I, I see a God that is trying to redeem us and save us and protect us from the evil one that wants only to destroy you. As a husband... As a father, I didn't marry Lael, and we didn't have two little girls in our life. I, I didn't do all that just so I'd have at least three people in my life I could make miserable. That was never my intent. I married Lael because she makes me happy. I want to make her happy. Now sometimes, I'm telling you, we're like all of you. But we try to be a blessing to each other. My girls are all grown up now. And they've got homes and families of their own. And, but I still want to be a blessing to them. I don't want to control everything they did and, and what they're doing now. I'm not trying to control them. I don't want to make their life miserable and take away all the happiness. I want to protect them. I want to guide them. I, I, want, to, I want to help be a part of the process that saves them so that they're in heaven one day to live with God, to live with Jesus, to live with his, their family forever and ever. That's what I want. That's what God wants for us. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 7. He, when he talks about, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock, the door will be opened unto you. But then he says this in verse 9, talking especially to you dads out there. Which one of you fathers, if your son asks for bread, and again, you don't want to make his life miserable, if he asks you for a, a piece of bread, would you give him a stone? Or if he asks you for a fish, would you give him a snake? So Jesus says, if then you who are evil, all that means is you're sinful, you're sinners. You're not perfect fathers, you're not perfect dads, you're not perfect husbands. If you who are sinful, who are evil, if you know how to give good things 
to your son, to your daughters, to your family? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? Because that's what he wants. He's not trying to control your life. He's trying to guide your life. He's not trying to ruin your life. He's trying to save your life. Yes, there are laws and precepts and commands, but they are not to control you. They are to protect you so that you can have the good life and receive the good things that God would give you. Now, if you want to walk close with God, then you're going to have to listen to Him. If you want a close relationship with God, you need to be hearing the things that He is saying to you. Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. It's not just about reading God's Word. It's also about being obedient. That's, that's a, anathema in this culture today, to be obedient. Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. Blessed, rather, are those who hear the Word of God and then keep it. James says, be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving themselves. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. Don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, otherwise, you are just fooling yourself. I know you're here this morning because you want a richer, deeper, more satisfying, more meaningful relationship with the God who loves you most. So pick up the Word of God. Do it every day. Do it intentionally, not just so you can check off those chapters uh, in, your, in your daily reading. Listen. Listen. Hear the voice of God speaking to you. Now, I know what, you're going to hit those roadblocks sometimes where it becomes difficult. Maybe don't start in the Old Testament. Especially if, if you're not as familiar with the Scriptures, don't start in the Old Testament. Start in the New Testament. We're, we're a New Testament. We're a New Covenant people. Maybe start in the New Testament. Start with the Gospel. Start with the words of Christ. Start reading there. Be blessed by the words of the Son of God. And then the King James Bible, it, it has served God's people well for about 400 years now. I would say a good many of us in this room this morning, we were raised going to church and listening and reading and, and learning from the King James Bible. But the truth is, none of us, none of us still talk like that way today. Words like thee and thou and, and saith and knoweth and verily, verily, we don't talk like that unless we're praying. Sometimes, sometimes those words sneak into our prayers for some reason, but... But we don't talk, we don't, unless we're in a Shakespearean play, we don't use Eliz, Elizabethan uh, speech anymore. So I wouldn't recommend, not that there's really anything inherently wrong with it, but I wouldn't recommend the King James Bible. Get one of the good, well-translated, modern translations today. I usually preach from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Many of you probably have the NIV, that new international version. And there's, there's many others. One, one that I might recommend to you is the New Living Translation. It's not a paraphrase, it's a translation. And it's really in our common language. And it's on a level that I believe that just about every one of us, no matter our biblical knowledge or, or understanding, I think that that is a, a good translation to use if you struggle maybe understanding the Word of God. That might be a place for you to start. Get a good, modern translation of the Bible, but then get into it. Don't ever ignore it. Be intentional. And listen to the voice of God. Because if you want God and His Word to make the biggest difference in your life, trust His voice. Trust God. And then obey His voice word. Your relationship will grow deeper. Your life will go better. Doesn't mean you won't have problems. Doesn't mean you won't have surgery. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have health issues or, or relationship issues. It just means that when you really follow the word of God, life goes better. And then ultimately, you have the greatest reward and blessing of all, knowing that God is building for you a home in heaven. So let's trust his voice and obey His word.
And if we can help you in any other way, if we can encourage you, if we can pray with you, maybe someone here online or here this morning, maybe you've come to the decision in your life that you're ready to put Christ on in baptism, to confess your faith in Jesus and to trust him completely for the salvation that would be yours. Maybe today you're ready to turn away from sin, confess his name, be baptized into Christ Jesus. If there's a spiritual need that anyone might have, please come while we stand together and we sing. What a glory he sheds on our way. How new his good will. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy. standing job leading our worship today. Thank you, Tom. This morning, I've asked uh, for this time at the end of our assembly uh, to share some exciting news, I think, with you. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1 says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And so I'd like to talk to you about what time it is. 17 years ago, next month, this church graciously invited my family and me, to move here and to work with this wonderful church. Given the same opportunity, I would do it all over again. I'm honored to be your preaching minister. And let me be quick to say, I'm not resigning. I'm not announcing my retirement. Lael and I have no intention or desire to leave this church because we love it so deeply. But recently, I have felt called to serve this church in a different role, one in which I would spend less time in the pulpit and more time working in other ways to strengthen our church family. In March, I wrote a request to the shepherds asking for a change in my role. The elders have graciously, uh, uh, graciously approved my new role as senior minister for involvement, and it will take effect August 1st of this year. A few of my key responsibilities will be to continue to preach in most of the Sunday, uh, Sunday evening assemblies, and to encourage our guests to place membership and to be involved and support our small groups so that college church members all feel connected and supported. I'll continue to minister to our church family and look for new opportunities for outreach to the Searcy community and the kingdom everywhere. College church has always been a dream job for me, and I'm continually grateful to be here. And Lael joins me in thanking our elders and all of you for the love and support that you have shown us through these years. I know our leaders covet your prayers and support as we work together uh, toward making this transition. I'm excited. I want you to know that I'm excited about this new role. My mind is still churning with ideas about how I can better serve in this capacity. You are a great church, 
And our greatest days are still well ahead of us. God bless the College Church of Christ. I believe now Glenn has something, some words to share. Thank you, Noah. Certainly we love both you and Lael and your sweet family. In conjunction uh, with Noel's announcement on behalf of the elders, I would like to announce that we have hired Jordan Guy to be our preaching minister at the College Church. Jordan will assume that role on August the 1st with his first Sunday preaching scheduled for August the 13th. Jordan will continue to teach in the College of Bible at Harding while, sir, while he serves as our Sunday morning preacher and assumes other responsibilities at the College Church. Jordan and Taylor and their family have been a part of the College Church for seven years. They've been involved in different ministries, including Lads to Leaders and Adult Education as well. Jordan teaches a Wednesday night Bible class uh, in the family room, that, which many of you attend, and he's currently teaching on Sunday mornings in room 100. Thank you. Let's close with a prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning and for these wonderful words that we've been able to hear today, this reminder of how powerful your word is and how you have spoken into this world. And it is our responsibility to listen. And by listening, we don't mean just hearing the words, but we we understand that when we listen, it implies that we also obey and that we do. And so as we reflect on what Noel shared with us this morning about being the kinds of people who obey your word and hear your word, I pray that you will spark our imaginations to think about how we might be able to serve you in this community, serve you in this church, how we can take these, these good words of gospel message of good news from, of, about your son Jesus and share them with others. Help us to look for ways to help. Help us look for ways to be your hands and feet. I pray for this congregation as, as we have just um, listened to a very important announcement about transition. And we take comfort in knowing that your spirit never changes, that your word never changes, and that this church is always, as long as we are, the College Church of Christ, that no matter who is preaching, no matter what titles we have, that as long as we are a faithful body of believers, you will be with us. And we pray that you, that you will work through our ministry staff, work through us as elders, work through us as deacons, work through our volunteers to continue to be, help us be this church that you want us to be in this town. We thank you for how we take comfort in knowing that you are always with us, that we share in the one spirit, and we're led by your word that is a light for our path. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.